Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Matthew Riley? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing my in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the alleged crime, then offer my analysis. This case takes place in 2023 in the state of Rhode Island. Matthew Riley was a member of the city council in Cranston. He represented Ward 6 and was the chairman of the local Republican Party. In addition to being a council member, Matthew was also an attorney. He had two young daughters and was in the process of getting divorced. Now moving to the timeline of the alleged crime. On Monday, May 15, 2023, at 11.28 a.m., a passerby flagged down an officer near Pontiac Avenue and Marine Drive, concerned about a man in a vehicle who appeared to be choking. This man was later identified as Matthew Riley. The officer's body camera activated during the encounter with Matthew. The officer opened the vehicle door and saw that Matthew appeared to be unconscious. There was a glass pipe and a lighter in Matthew's hand. The officer touched Matthew's hand and startled him. Matthew appeared to be disoriented. Matthew stepped out of his vehicle and was patted down. The officer explained how he saw Matthew choking and he would have to be checked out by rescue, like paramedics. Matthew responded, I have sleep apnea, I'm sorry. The officer then mentioned how Matthew had a crack pipe in his hand. He appeared to be sympathetic to Matthew and even talked about how he had a body camera so he couldn't pretend about what he was seeing. I do not think this statement reflects too well on the officer. What would he do if he didn't have a body camera activated? The officer then implied that this was just a matter of rescue coming out and verifying that Matthew was okay. There was no criminal investigation. I'm not sure what the officer was thinking here. Possession of paraphernalia is definitely a crime in Rhode Island. The officer had stated just a few moments earlier that Matthew had a crack pipe in his hand. It really looked like the officer was trying to cut Matthew a break due to Matthew's status as a lawyer and a council member. Matthew was relieved to hear the news that he would not be arrested, although this excitement would not last long based on what would happen next. The officer and Matthew talked about Matthew's drug problem. Matthew said it was a relapse. He had been clean for 13 years. He implied this relapse was due to a really bad divorce. The officer conducted a basic search of Matthew's vehicle. Paramedics arrived on the scene, and Matthew was evaluated. Officers tested these substances found in Matthew's vehicle and determined that they were crack and fentanyl. He was placed under arrest at the scene and spoke to another officer. Matthew told this officer that the drugs in his vehicle had cost him $100. The officer explained to him how this arrest was going to be beneficial for him in the end. He claimed that Matthew would say to the police a month from now that getting arrested was the best thing that ever happened to him. The officer stated that Matthew wasn't the man that he knew and that his health and well-being was worth more than any political career. Matthew seemed highly interested in his arrest not being made public. However, he was disappointed to hear the officer say that the arrest record would be public. A couple of officers told Matthew that he would not be detained too long. He would be processed and released quickly. They seemed to be going out of their way to make Matthew comfortable during his arrest experience. It was a cordial and polite arrest, almost like Matthew possessed some type of privilege. Matthew was charged with one count of possession of Schedule II narcotics. He resigned his position as a council member, and the Rhode Island Supreme Court suspended his law license. Somehow, I doubt that Matthew will ever look upon his arrest as the best thing that ever happened to him, but it may have been the best thing for the residents of Cranston, Rhode Island. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. It's more than a little worrisome that the first police officer on the scene mentioned how the body camera stopped him from pretending. I realize sometimes officers make unwise statements that don't necessarily reflect their intent or attitude, but this was a potentially significant revelation. There is a sense that if he never turned the body camera on, this whole situation would have been swept under the rug. 
there's nothing as inspiring as a police officer who bends over backwards not to enforce the law. Also, this officer was eager to mute the sound on his body camera several times during his time at the scene, like when he was talking to other officers. This should not be permitted. If there is some policy that prevents all the exchanges captured on the body camera from being released, then it can be edited to remove the sound at a later time. That's reasonable under certain circumstances, but everything should be recorded initially. If the data were never stored, they can never be recovered if needed. Item number two. If one were to assume that Matthew is actually guilty, as he admitted on the body camera video, some people have argued that Matthew made an innocent mistake. Like, this is no big deal. He had some crack laced with fentanyl. Everybody does it. Everybody makes these types of mistakes. They argued that he had no intention of driving the vehicle when he was done with his little party, even though he was wearing his seatbelt and mentioned how he was on his way back to court. The officer's soft treatment of Matthew may have influenced some opinions, like people look at Matthew as a victim of substances instead of a perpetrator of a drug offense. In reality, it's likely that he is both at the same time. I think it's worth considering how Matthew has had some interesting experiences in his past that speak to his attitude toward substance use and honesty. A media outlet obtained court documents from August of 2022 that included text messages between Matthew and a client of his. In the messages, Matthew indicated that he gave his children nighttime medicine in order to meet the client late at night for sex. Matthew's ex-wife told the court that she had received phone calls from her eldest daughter in the middle of the night. The daughter was upset because she woke up and her father was not home. The text messages contained information that Matthew was using Adderall, marijuana, and cocaine. Somehow the cocaine part does not come as a surprise. Matthew also allegedly conspired with the client to falsely accuse his wife of violating a no-contact order. Matthew wrote the fabricated story in a text message that the client was supposed to give to the police. It involved the client falsely stating that she observed a woman standing in front of a minivan at Matthew's office. The woman was screaming. Matthew told the woman to leave, and she did. Then she came back five minutes later and did the same thing. In this fabricated story, the woman is Matthew's ex-wife. Reportedly, at least two attorneys and a family court judge notified the court's chief disciplinary counsel about Matthew's drug use and how he was having sex with clients. With all this in mind, is Matthew really just an innocent angel who fell on tough times? I don't know, but his behavior certainly is worrisome. It's worth noting that Matthew repeatedly tried to escape responsibility for smoking crack, including telling officers that he smoked earlier and didn't have any drugs in the vehicle. Matthew didn't appear to be remorseful at all. He was only concerned about escaping the consequences of his behavior. Item number three, when looking at Matthew's use of crack combined with the other allegations, including having sex with clients, it seems to indicate a larger pattern of destructive and negative behavior. This is very common for people with problematic substance use. The substance use rarely exists in isolation. Many people want to believe that drug users are individuals who made one innocent mistake that haunts them for the rest of their lives. In reality, this is usually not the case. For many substance users, if the use of the substance itself stopped, that would not stop many of the destructive behaviors. Personality factors like impulsiveness and sensation-seeking would still lead to problems in that person's life. Recovering from substance use is really about addressing the wide variety of factors that contributed to the use. It's not as simple as getting rid of the drugs. Addiction is a complex problem for many reasons, including that many of the contributing circumstances cannot always be controlled. But throughout all of these stressors, a person's ability to make choices is a constant. Everyone has that ability. They might not fully understand the consequences of their choices, but using substances often involves a poor decision, especially in the beginning. Repeated drug use can compromise a person's ability to make responsible and informed decisions, so one could argue that over a long period of substance use, people no longer have the same control over their choices. This only reinforces how the initial decision is crucial. In the case of Matthew Riley, 
he said that this was a relapse after 13 years. This really sounds like he made a decision to use and does not want to accept responsibility. Item number four. One of the notable elements about this case is that Matthew Riley was both a lawyer and a city council member. Being a council member is not stunningly impressive. However, it is a position that enjoys some level of authority, and there are certain expectations as far as integrity. People may wonder why a person in Matthew's position would end up using substances. Why would he be willing to risk so much? Clearly, he must have worked hard to get to where he was. Now he's been publicly embarrassed with his devastating fall from grace. He has lost so much. I don't know the specific reasons in his case, but in general, addiction is not always strongly affected by consequences. Sometimes whatever the person is risking does not matter. It is immaterial. It does not contribute to the decision to use substances. The mentality of a person using substances places those substances on a pedestal. They are the only thing that matters. The substances are always the star of the show. Now moving to my final thoughts. A major risk with the type of arrest featured in this case, one that is highly embarrassing and comes with massive consequences, is that the person may give up on trying to break free of the substances. Sometimes being arrested is a wake-up call that does lead to change, but often it is simply a reminder of how far someone has descended. They may feel like they have no chance of recapturing their former glory. All their good work has been erased, and all they have is a substance use. Sometimes an embarrassing arrest is the victory dance of substances. Those are my thoughts in the case of Matthew Riley. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.